Hi, welcome back to Literally Literary. If this is your first time joining us, be sure to check out our previous episodes. This episode, we will begin our discussion on Everything Begins and Ends at the Kentucky Club by Ben Sines. My name is Vanessa, and this is Literally Literary, which is brought to you by the Mellon Foundation through the Humanities Collaborative at EPCC and UTEP. And feel free to uh, ask us questions. We're fielding questions for this book. Uh, it's, um, it's a book, it's a first collection that we're looking at that is set here. So I think it's a good opportunity for people from El Paso. And even if you're not from here, just to, you know, uh, ask us anything about it that you want us to talk about uh, during one of our episodes about it. Yeah, definitely. We still have two more episodes planned. So, you know, we expect maybe throughout the next week. Uh, how how might people go about asking us or sending us messages? You can reach us through the Instagram account that we have at literallyliterary.ep. Bam. There it is. Magic. <laughs> <laughs> but if there's anything, if you've read it already and you just want to like explore, if there's a theme that you particularly love and want us to, to explore a little bit more, or if there's any, or if there are any questions you might have, you know, we'd love to see how we, you know, could find some answers, or at least have a riveting discussion on anything you submit. So we'd love to hear from you guys. Uh, we definitely want to get more interaction with you guys, the community. Yeah, especially this book, um, and you know, just Ben, ben Signs himself um, is such a big voice for the border in so many ways, not just through his writing, mm-hmm. you know, but I think. You and I, Richie in particular, can speak to um, his activism, Mm -hmm. you know, going back to our UTIP days and when he was uh, quite outspoken about the Juarez violence, which we see reified here. Mm -hmm. Um, But is that somebody's mic there? It stopped. Hmm. Oh, yeah, it did. Yeah. Might have been mine. All right. And um, many of you listeners might know been from uh his most one of his most recent books which is aristotle and dante discover the secrets of the universe which i hear through a little bird that is it's going to um it's it's being turned into a film developed yeah yeah that been into a film um but ultimately we decided on on everything begins and ends um which is um also said in the in the border but it's it's for a much uh, more mature audience. Uh, Vanessa, why is it that you think uh, this book um, is something you you wanted to talk about over Aristotle and Dante, which we we've, we've all read as well? I think I liked this one because it is short stories, so I felt like we had more to talk about. Um, but also because it's more specifically El Paso. Whereas Aristotle and Dante didn't really feel like it was. Mm-hmm. Um, this is specific, like there's streets, like it's mm-hmm. places that I know and that I'm familiar with yeah. that I'm reading about now. Yeah, that definitely does does stand out, you know, upon reading, picking up the book and, and being able to visualize a lot of these places. Right. Like I think we, we finished um, The Hate You Give by by riffing on the whole Harry Potter, Harry mm-hmm. Potter universe. But <laughs> yeah. You know, at the same time, not many of us have been to England or London or, you know, magical realms mm-hmm. that, that live in that, that pertain to that area. But we might recognize street names here and even have lived through the sunsets and the type and, and the type of weather that's described. And I think there's, there's a little bit of power in that. And more so, again, being able to identify with, you know, the people in this book in one way or another, either it be through the way that our lives um, are part of this whole border structure, the two cities and whether it be separated through the border and like kind of traveling back and forth, there's a lot of different stories. And I think um, Ben goes through the nuances very well in each of these stories of the ways in which people are connected to or, or disconnected because of the border in in a variety of ways. And and, uh, as you were saying right now, you know the border violence. Um, we were we were very active. I remember as undergrads, you know, we we were getting involved, and and Ben Sines was one of the faculty members who was <clears throat> willing to go out. And of course, this book touches on it. And, but I remember we we wouldn't have we would even have like faculty readings. Mm-hmm. Uh, both of us were in the creative writing society at UTEP 
on the grads. And I remember we, one of our first poetry readings was with UTEP faculty. Mm-hmm. Ben Sines read, Sasha Pimenta. Um, you you read, Lex read, yeah. um, I read, Jose, uh, Jose Angel Maldonado. Mm-hmm. Now faculty over at Utah, I want to say. Yeah. And, and of course, Natalie Center Sapico, who's, who's one of our classmates. She's got some great poetry out there. Yeah. So I think about like how important it is to that establishment of like literary, like literary El Paso, literary border here, mm-hmm. you know. And, and And on that note, too. Everything begins and ends at the Kentucky Club is published by Cinco Punto Press, right? That's the the birds, right? Bobby Bird here and Five Points who started this press, and that's that's something we want to do is 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 have this culture of not just writers but establishments that support, you know, writers like presses and, and let's keep it going like podcasts, literary <laughs> podcasts. Yeah, and both Vanessa and I got to meet the birds at um at the Texas Book Festival, and I do want to say if they're listening that. You know they they were all they, they were all very friendly to us and and accommodating and generous with their time and and advice and um um so I'm really grateful for the time that we were able to talk to them about you know um, literature and publishing and things like that um what before we we talk about the book proper um what did you guys want to say about um Ben Signs himself. Hmm. Like, are there other other works or? Um, ah, okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, Vanessa, would you like to go first? I mean, I've only ever ever read one of his other books, which is the Aristotle and Dante. Mm-hmm. Um, but in reading that, I was also able to meet him, so that was really interesting because he sat right across the table from me, <laughs> and just talked about his book and mm-hmm. himself, I guess. Yeah. Um, so that was really cool. Yeah, uh, and so he used to teach at UTIP, um, mm-hmm. you know, creative writing. He used to be the chair of the department. Yeah. Um, and, and hosted a, a, a radio program. We were kind of like a mm-hmm. like a little stepchild, perhaps, of that. Um, mm-hmm. Words on a Wire. Yeah. With, he used to host that with Daniel Chacon. Yeah. Uh, but ever since he left, it's, it's now with uh, Tim Hernandez, who's also mm-hmm. faculty there at UTIP, creative yeah. writing department. Yeah, and he's got also... Um, I think most people know him for his young adult work. You know, mm-hmm. I know I have a cousin, Gabby, who just loves his young adult fiction. Um, mm-hmm. You know, last night I sang to the monster. Um, um, the um, um, Sammy and Juliana in Hollywood, and um, you know he he's also a great poet. Yeah. Uh, Calendar of <clears throat> Dust, uh, the Book of What Remains, and then most recently the Last Cigarette, Cigarette. on Earth. Which is great poetry collections. Have you read that? Have you read those? Mm-hmm. I, I've read uh, two of those three. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, have you? Uh, yeah, I have the book of what remains and last cigarette on earth. Sag up, uh, and the last cigarette on earth. Um, yeah. They kind of remind me of like uh, extensions of of this first story in, in Kentucky Club, but we'll we'll, we'll kind of dive into that later. But yeah, you know they're 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 good poems, you know, and they're. They're they're very much situation situated in in the the area the region and and kind of meditations on his life and, you know as as it is now getting older and yeah meditation great writer love his style yeah yeah, yeah. I think uh, so speaking <clears throat> of his style um, Vanessa you've been exposed to a lot of different writing styles throughout your you know English <laughs> major oh my God. <laughs> yeah um, and so how would you do, distinguish it how do, what does it remind you of or how would you contrast it to other styles okay um <laughs> let's begin i'm just kidding <laughs> um i think he has a very well not a very but a more simplistic style of writing he doesn't use a lot of crazy big words or mm-hmm. really long sentences it's very to the point mm-hmm. but he also is able to in these really short sentences create a really beautiful imagery and he has really strong lines like sometimes it's entire paragraphs of just really strong lines Mm -hmm. um but I also feel like he his writing style definitely directed to a particular audience Mm -hmm. and I think a lot of that audience is El Pasoans Mm -hmm. um Hmm. 
So a lot of them, a lot of people here are bilingual, but a lot of them also their first language is Spanish. Mm -hmm. So I feel like his writing style is caters to them because they're able to also grasp the story and understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, we were both talking before the, the, the hit record, but in the that, show before the show, <laughs> yeah, that, um, you know, uh, I myself, Reina, and others have taught this book in, in, in our DevEd classes, and it's, it's super accessible, even though the themes themselves, which, you know, you mentioned the border violence, right? I mean, that, that, that's very, um, that can be hard to get through. Um, but I think in its minimalism, you know, I think uh, Ben is kind of, a, you know, a um, descendant of the Hemingway school of, you know, being concise and yet yeah. precise. And, and unlike Hemingway, I think he's a little bit more poetic. And I think that's the power of his prose, mm -hmm. you know, um, because Faulkner, you know, is as long winded as and eloquent as he is, you know, I don't think necessarily he's as poetic and mm -hmm. and um you know i think that says a lot about a writer to be able to compress your language in a way that packs a lot of meaning right i mean yeah. and yet it's still prose yeah i'm um, so in grad school we read a lot a lot i mean in undergrad too you're reading a lot yes mm -hmm. <laughs> and so i think at some point like we started reading academic articles and and just these these deep analyses on texts and mm -hmm. i remember at some point one of our professors had to remind us that hey you know ultimately we we're doing this because we love reading for fun and we had to remind ourselves of the joy of reading and what we get out of that and and i think ben's work reminds me of that the joy of reading mm -hmm. of being able to have a, a line hit you in a certain way mm -hmm. to inspire you to to motivate you even even make you just kind of mourn a little bit because these mm -hmm. stories are are a little bit of all of that you know mm -hmm. the, these these kind of palettes and tastes of the border mm -hmm. borderland and and so yeah when you talk about a style like i have, I have mm -hmm. so many lines that i just underlined mm -hmm. because i love the way yeah. they they relayed human experience mm -hmm. through through the mind the way he conveys uh body language you know Thank you. As, yeah. As a writer myself, I, I absolutely love like the secret language of body language, you know, that yeah. that's the unspoken mm -hmm. stuff. And he writes about it so well. Yeah. Very astute observations about the human condition, right? And, and even through those little things like body language um, and very universal, I think, as a writer, you mm -hmm. know, because um, kind of going a little bit into the text now is that um, just about all the stories of which there are seven and this was published back in 2012, um, have uh, uh, gay characters in them, or LGBT characters, I should say, mm -hmm. or characters who are questioning, you know, their own gender in some way or another. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, we'll, we'll talk more about the specifics uh, in subsequent episodes, but, you know, I think um, that that's that's part of the the... You know that that's when you know um, that you're a good writer. I think that I I mentioned that before when you're able to relate s some subjective experience and make it <laughs> universal, make it speak to everyone. Um, so it's not just necessarily that we're from the border, you know. <laughs> I'm I'm showing them one of my pages where I write it's so relatable. <laughs> oh yeah, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah, you're just on that, and I was like, "Whoa, look at what my page says, what my <laughs> my marginal notes—they don't yes. lie." Yeah, <laughs> books don't lie either. <laughs> um, and uh, speaking of uh, the border, border community, and and the border writing communities more specifically, you talked about Cinco Puntos, um, but I mm -hmm. think a lot of people also, when we mention when we talk about El Paso specifically. I mm -hmm. think they think more um, the Wild West to some degree. And, and so that kind of brings to mind Cormac McCarthy. And we've all read, you know, some different works of his. And, you know, of course, um, he wasn't born here. He was born in Tennessee. But, you know, he did spend a lot of time here mm -hmm. and wrote, of course, the Border Trilogy and a lot of other works. But um, he's kind of on the other side of the spectrum to me. 
as far as his running style, right, as a descendant of right. Faulkner. Um, but I think uh, it's important to kind of shine a light on other writers besides Cormac, you know, because Cormac does, of course, draw a lot of attention and a lot of it, of course, is is um, is um, uh, do right. Like there's a lot of deference to him because of his his work. Um, but I think that it's important to talk about works like this one from Ben mm -hmm. that, you know, uh, find ways to make the border in some ways even more real you know because i think one thing about cormac is he's he can be very existential and and i think nihilistic at some points but i think ben is just more down to earth you know salt mm -hmm. with the earth type yeah and, he, and he's got that that heart to it and i think he even uh you know touches on it in a lot of these even though there's the tragedy in in a lot of them he uses this quote from the bible blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. He kind of talks about like, just like the heart and humanity of, of all these things as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, the book itself uh, is uh, the winner of the Penn Faulkner award for winner. I mean, if we were talking about Faulkner, right. And um, to this day, he's still the, the only Latinx uh, writer to win that award. Other Latinx writers have been nominated like Risurea. But he's still to this day the only one mm -hmm. who's won it. I think, you know, that says a lot about this book. But I think it also says a lot about the award industry mm -hmm. and how um, it's still very white centric. And, um, and um, you know, it's slowly through people like Ben that we break those barriers, mm -hmm. you know. But um, going into the, the collection itself, um, so, you know, we already mentioned the, the, the border violence, but uh, in all seven stories, we have different characters. So none of the, char the characters overlap, but what they do have in common is a lot of things. And one of those things is the setting. Uh, all of these stories are set during the height of the Juarez violence, which started in 2006 up to about. 2012 and 2013 and up to to this day there's still yeah. uh, you know some of it but it wasn't i would say as prominent as it was back then um and uh all of these stories also share the the setting of um the kentucky club and uh, hence the name um and to those of you who are listening who aren't too familiar with the kentucky club um it, it it's 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 a kind of um it's one of those like a guy's guy bar, you know, um, very. Um, I mean, it's a bar to me that kind of um, speaks about masculinity, mm -hmm. which itself in the collection is is what Ben is trying to get at through his stories. Um, and we were talking about, you know, have you guys ever been here in this amongst ourselves? Um, but did you guys know, by the way, the story behind it, like what it's famous for? Inventing the Margarita. Yeah, the Margarita. And um, also during Prohibition, as far as why it's called the Kentucky Club. My understanding is it's called the Kentucky Club because during the Prohibition, and you were too young, Vanessa, but... Uh, um, <laughs> yeah, we were having Prohibition. <laughs> yeah. I know, I was like, yeah. like you were there? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Totally. <No. laughs> um, you know, um, that was where they smuggled bourbon into... And so that also, in turn, brought a lot of famous people into. And so I'll just run through some of the names, you know, Elizabeth Taylor, um, The Doors, Ronald Reagan, John Wayne, um, JFK, uh, Mar Marilyn Monroe, who, uh, in turn, I mean, just a little side story that's completely self-serving. But my grandfather actually divorced uh, Mar Marilyn Monroe when um, she came to Juarez and the reason why she was getting divorced from another art writer, um, Arthur Miller, mm -hmm. right, the playwright, was because in Mexico it was a lot easier to get divorced than it is here. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, back then divorces were a lot simpler and my grandfather was a divorce attorney. Um, and so he's no longer here, so, so I would have brought him on the show if if he was, but um, one thing I do remember him saying about it is um, 
kind of um, how he got to spend some time with her after, like they went to go celebrate the divorce. And I think they went to the Kentucky Club from mm. what I remember. I mean, I was a kid when I he told me about it. But, um, you know, it has that allure. And yet you go there and it's just like in the, any other bar, you know. But I think that rich history has a lot um, in, in, in the story from the characters that mean it means something different to each of the characters yeah. in the stories. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, one of the things that, that um kind of the thread if, if you will is not just an appearance in the kentucky kentucky club at some point but just kind of how they deal with trauma yeah <clears throat> i think just about every story has a funeral in it and uh or the death of someone you know and i think what ben is trying to get at in this collection that i find very important and uh that i think we as a as a culture in america sometimes you know sweep under the rug is how do we deal with the death of someone, you know? And I think there's a drastic difference between how America does it and with Dia de los Muertos in, in Mexico. Mm. Um, and I think uh, that's part of the big, one of the big themes of this, along with, um, you know, uh, the how to deal with the what is violence as this kind of abstract thing, but also as something that is very real, right? That is knocking on your front door. Um, did you guys have other thoughts on the um, Ben or, or the collection itself before we dive into it later on? Like general observations that kind of struck you about what he's doing, what he's what's happening in the stories, like food or anything? Or I'm gonna get hungry. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like, so kind of going back to his style, I think one of the things that we were talking about the, on, in the show before the show, our discussion was his, uh, you know, his use of food as well, talking about food. And, and uh, the first story has a lot of these moments of, like, metafiction, at least in the sense that, you know, it's it's about a writer, thinking about writing a lot of time, mm -hmm. you know, obviously during the plot. But there's just, to me, there's a very funny moment of <clears throat> they're they're – talking about his novels and you know his love interest is like well you're always writing about food you know and you know um the main character carlos Juan carlos is mm -hmm. he's like well yeah characters have to eat too right? mm -hmm. and then a little a little not too long <laughs> after that right he's making food in the story yeah yeah and also the 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 border food, right? Like sopa de fideo, chilerianos. Which, we, which uh, <clears throat> yeah, you know, we're talking about like the importance of like recognizing places. It's also recognizing the food mm -hmm. because food is culture. Mm -hmm. You know, the way we live every, every, our everyday life, the kind of food we grew up with and what we know, maybe. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, there's a lot of scholarship on, on food and its ties to culture, but also food and its ties to memory. So I know... Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so this first yeah. story here, I know we're kind of maybe start talking about it now mm -hmm. on uh, page 26, right? Um, maybe Adam jumping ahead, we can go back if we need to after this. But since we're talking about food, uh, page 26, uh, he's making some, some food, right? And it's kind of playing off of this line a little earlier of characters need to eat. And he's taking care of this new love interest, Javier, this man he's falling in love with. Just, just absolutely, like, through the eyes of a poet, right? He's building this, uh, him up, right? From the very first lines of the of this story, he's building him up in in this way. But he's, you know, he's, here he's taking care of him. He's making food, something very simple. He says, uh, <clears throat> he's making potato soup. He's like, cleaned potatoes, cubed them, cubed some onions, threw them into the pot, and added some salt, some pepper, some garlic, chopped up some cilantro. We've done that, you know? Yeah. And I'm like, I can imagine, you know, these motions. And it, but the way he continues, right? A poor man's soup. Not that I was poor, but making the soup reminded me of my mother. I loved her, and I loved her soup. So you have these, this connection of, of food to your, your culture, your memories. And I think that does kind of weave in and out at, and through some of the stories as well. For sure. That's one of the, the, the functions of the food, besides what you mentioned as the cultural markers. And I think there's also some of 
that as far as food as the power that it has to heal and bring people together. Mm -hmm. The power of food, I think, in, in, in Mexican culture to bring people together, mm -hmm. you know, share a meal, break bread, right? I mean, it's in the the Last Supper, right? Yeah. You know? Hospitality. Hospitality, yeah. And um, uh, so I think that that's the power of food in these stories is, you know, it allows people to come together after they have they fight or something mm -hmm. you know and even just preparing the food yeah. itself is very important and again, and again trauma i think um something i don't know if that you know like awake even after funerals mm. people coming together mm -hmm. yeah, through food for sure you know families i know will do that like no yeah and just remember their loved one yeah through, through eating yeah i mean because you know funerals are such a sh somber occasion and like i said in 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 this collection, we see so many of them that he clearly is kind of interrogating, you know, our relationship to our dead loved ones, mm -hmm. you know, and because we see so many different kinds of funerals. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> but, um, you know, f food is one of those bridges. Uh, um, uh. S speaking of bridges, I think the other theme in this collection to me is about what does crossing over mean? Mm. Because as as I tell my students when we talk about this collection, one of the things is um, it seems the characters when they cross over, it's like Vegas, like what happens in Juarez stays in Juarez. You know, mm. uh, they can be whoever they want to be because mm. even though we're you know Opaso and Juarez are are symbiotic, yeah, uh, there's still something to be said about how when they go to that bar, it's like. They forget about where they are, who they are. They can yeah. be anyone. <clears throat> and uh, I think there's something magical about that. Yeah. And yet, at the same time, of course, dangerous because, of course, you know, a lot of these characters have a lot of, um, you know, um, issues that they're going through, whether mm -hmm. it's addiction, whether it's the is violence itself. Yeah. That's a, <clears throat> like the way you put that, you know, in, in, the, in my book, I was kind of thinking about, you know, because I, I write all over my margins. I'm one of those. But I was I was kind of talking about, like, thinking about the paradoxical, like, attachment, unattachment, like, kind of. To to the, and winning. To what? To the to the borderlands, right? Mm. You know, to El Paso, Juarez, crossing, you know, going back and forth for a lot of these characters um, has that, right? You're, you're talking about that yeah. right now, about this, yeah. this space. It's like, you know, <clears throat> like in quantum physics, when you talk about everything and nothing being part of the same thing mm -hmm. which is you know we don't want to get into too many mind <laughs> mind experiments thought experiments but you know there's this attachment and unattachment at the same time yeah i mean in that sense it's kind of it's miltonian you know the mm. idea of of mind of the mind itself you know as a space right as a, as a place as a place as well that you inhabit and you make of it what, what mm -hmm. you are mm -hmm. And so there is a lot of a passing in these stories because all of these characters, for the most part, they're middle to upper class, um, you know, except for one who's um, we can talk about later. But, yeah. you know, I think um, it, it's that idea of, um, you know, passing and um, just how is it that just crossing the border? What does crossing the border mean to these characters? I think that's part of um, hmm. the, another of the themes of, of this collection. Vanessa, what, uh, what else did you want to see about this so far? You know, I'm really excited to like go further in and talk about his writing style. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Once we each choose specific stories that we want to talk about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, because I do like his use of italics that was one thing that i oh yeah found really interesting hmm. um could you explain that to the listeners so there's a couple of instances that he uses it um do, 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 do. there's the use of italicizing um spanish words um hmm. but he doesn't do it for all spanish words so i found that that was interesting um also the use of italics for emphasis was another way that he used them um do, 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 thoughts was another one that yeah. he used um and text messages he mm. italicizes those instead of what i'm used to seeing um which is like a different font 
and like its own line is each text message. Here he just italicizes it, but it stays on that same line. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and um, you know whether that, that uh, stream of consciousness style that we get, kind of, um, <laughs> you know, because from the from the very first story, right, he has gone to be with a woman. You know, we get that italicized line uh, in this second paragraph about some people are so beautiful that they belong everywhere they go. You know, Which, and, and yeah. he happens to quote this one because it was the first sentence of his own story, right? So it's kind of like they, the layers, right, mm-hmm. of the writing. He's writing his own. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, of course, Faulkner is mentioned here. And I remember someone asked him about, you know, why Dostoevsky is because on Zach is in Faulkner and, and uh, Ben had mentioned that like that's his holy trinity of muses mm. um, of who inspires who inspired him um, so I, I thought that was interesting too <laughs> that is interesting in light of, of our conversation <laughs> earlier on his style yeah yeah <laughs> so you know hopefully Ben if you're listening uh, you can kind of uh, if you're kind enough to share a little more about that we'd love to hear from you uh, but also from you readers as well, like we were saying, you know, you, even if you haven't read the collection, I think, you know, this is a story. If you had anything that you wanted to share about what the border means to you, what, um, you know, anything that you want to say about um, crossing over, you know, I know a lot of our students, right, Richie, like cross over. Do that every day. Yeah. yeah so, um and even just the uh, the idea of exploring your identity, because of course a lot of these other books that we read deal a lot with this, but this is the first one where we have, you know, strictly LGBT. Uh, and so I think uh, it's important to be uh, to talk about that, mm-hmm. you know, especially because in Mexican culture we do have a lot of homophobia, mm-hmm. and uh, you know we see this in the collection as well, and from the <clears> very first story. Just briefly, I'll mention like um, the disappearance, yeah. um, and not of 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 um, of of you know the his mom, but um, you know he's taken in in, in this kind of uh, what seems to be like um, you know some could say it's a case of mistaken identity, but the way I interpret that when he's taken. Um, is um he's taken because he's he's gay yeah that's and, how i took it as well yeah uh and uh, i know dr campbell whom you know we both know from our work back then uh with activism is you know he uh had found some evidence that they were targeting gay clubs you know during the height of the, of the water's violence and they had they just massacred people there you know and it was just like that and and you know i think me from what is um i i lost i've lost people i've lost you know um neighbors i've lost um dentist um um you know my own father's business was um uh was extorted you know and uh so i think it, when i first read this story i was just able to relate to this first story in particular so much um uh, because of it and i think a lot of our readers will be able to as well if you haven't if you haven't read it um you know this would be uh mm-hmm. you know it's a good fireside read <clears throat> in the sense that like you were saying vanessa that you see it if you're from here mm-hmm. you know and i think it's important to have stories about the border because you know the canon is is very white yeah. you know and of course nothing in in and of itself is wrong with that right but we need to open the the bridge right you know open the drawbridge to these kinds of stories that students see themselves in and that they see the the setting as well yeah you know because uh, only one of us here has been to london and um (laughs) you know they got me. <laughs> they recruited you know, me. Yeah, it's you, too late. You went to the globe, right? So, yeah. you know, I think um, it's also a lot about the high low culture divide that mm-hmm. we think of when we think of um, stories that are multicultural that we think of as somehow lesser than just because they're not canonized. Yeah. So. Um, well, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I definitely don't think that, but it's definitely something we're we're fighting. 
mm-hmm. against. And uh, you know, I'm thinking about this. Ultimately, like it's it's a it's a good love story too, you know. Yeah. Like these these men finding finding each other in a kind of a tough moment, and just kind of that human softness, embracing us. He talks a lot about what it means to be a man a lot in this story. We were men like that, you know. He also talks about softness and and you know we do know on the border there's, there's a lot of machismo, a lot of yeah. You know, if you if you're different, there's these things that yeah. Um, but <clears throat> you know at the backdrop, it's it's a love story where each character is kind of set on two sides of the border, right? Yeah. Javier, you know he he's he can't leave Juarez, right? He even yeah. says, "What if everybody left?" Yeah, you know, people don't. Not everyone, has, not everyone has that option. Yeah, so true. To to leave, we called and, it the yeah. the mix of this, right? Mm-hmm. You know, during the height of the height of the water, we did see a lot of businesses spend. come here. A lot too. of businesses, a lot of uh, middle Families. and upper class audiences, mm-hmm. who, who, people who could mm-hmm. um, do yeah. that. Some yeah. people couldn't, and so that's what a lot of the first story is yeah. about, you know. Um, <clears throat> but um, and and um, I kind of like the way Ben introduces it, like slowly in the background. If you're not familiar with it, because mm-hmm. right off the bat, it's it's Juan Carlos, the main character, getting mm-hmm. the news. Mm-hmm. So he gets his news. He goes to the coffee shop. He doesn't get coffee from there. He always just picks up the newspaper. Mm-hmm. And it's through mm-hmm. the news that he introduces this idea of the violence and yeah. and also thoughts about the violence. Right? Javier yeah. is like, well, hey, um, violence is everywhere. Yeah, <laughs> you know, is a, is a real thing. And of course, um, they they both travel a lot, and visit each other throughout the story. But there's this, 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 the reality, and to me, my strong line for this story that I, that I kind of wrote or, or brought up mm-hmm. was a little bit after he takes care of, uh, Juan Carlos takes care of, of Javier and makes some soup and mm-hmm. <clears throat> it's page 28. They were talking about what happened to the mo- his mother mm-hmm. and it, it talks about the femicides, right? Mm-hmm. She's talking about her disappearing and I think um, he writes about what remains, right? So it's right after the line, she just disappeared. That paragraph, that whole thing, mm. to me, kind of sweeps like how you can have your life. You can have things set up. You could be doing your thing. And just like in an instant, everything changes, right? He says, that was the look he had, the look he wore on his face, the remnants of hurt. The emotional scar, the knowledge that all the laughter in the world could be swept away by a capricious wind at any moment, and there was nothing he could do about it. That's kind of like the the sentiment of this whole story, where these guys are having their 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 love, their moments, and it just changes like that, swept away. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, this is ultimately a collection about. Uh, tragedies but i think within the you know something you, you you see the tragedy there that you know um she was targeted because you know she was being active about it you mm-hmm. know and i think ben is i think almost almost definitely relying on the actual stories of so many activists journalists who were persecuted because they were speaking out about the violence mm-hmm. and i remember we brought in um, the poet um, javier cecilia Mm-hmm. You know, and so he brought a caravan of, of people all the way from Mexico City because his son was killed during the violence. And what happened to him is he stopped being a poet after his son died mm-hmm. because he, he just couldn't. There's no, you know, the trauma, right? The laughter has gone, right? The, the poetry, the. Yeah. And uh, so he came to the border, you know, and uh, he was very, very well spoken about what was going on and what he learned to his through his travels and i remember he confronted you know at the time president calderon about the violence and because a lot of the violence that we see in 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 what is is not necessarily just cartel violence you know which is cormac mccarthy's thing but you know uh corruption you know uh corrupt cops corrupt state police corrupt military yeah and uh, i can tell you you know that it, it is real yeah. And um, it's it's a big fear of just like in this first story, right? It's like if you remember that, where does he go? Right? Yeah, well, that's yeah, definitely. It's uh, this com- this feeling of complete helplessness. Mm-hmm. You know, going to the authorities and, and and knowing this this fact of, of, of also 
corruption and also just lack of knowledge for people that can help or even the ladies to tell you like you know you shouldn't ask like you don't either way yeah and you mentioned the femicides you know that didn't start with the Juarez violence right it started way back like mm-hmm. in the 90s and mm-hmm. maybe even the 80s and I think it, it is a lot of the misogyny that we see in this world you know that I think it's just another cause you know, of that violence that is targeted against women in particular. Um, and the desert, I think, is the last kind of big symbol here mm. in the stories is what, it, you know, the, the desert normally is seen as this kind of empty wasteland, like in, you know, mm. Mad Max style, right? Yeah. But I think Ben, unlike any other writer that I've encountered, is able to make the desert beautiful. And I think that really makes you proud to be from the border, mm-hmm. you know, because I don't know how you guys feel when you go somewhere else and you talk to people and like, you know, they say you're from El Paso and it's like they just think of this, you know, arid desert, dusty. right? Dusty, yeah. Dusty little town, you know, and I, I don't know about you, but I take offense of, you know, I think anyone would. And uh, yeah, I mean, people have a flanned image of, of what, you know, we know is something much more complex and beautiful has has you know like any other place <laughs> yeah you know it's gonna have some some depth to it yeah i mean it has its own problems mm-hmm. you know but i think um that that's what ben uh, that's what i like about ben is he doesn't pull back any punches right. without being too gruesome you know because you can be very gruesome about the border violence because it was incredibly gruesome and you know yeah. all kinds of things that happened that are in some ways unspeakable. Uh, and uh, unlike Cormac, who doesn't gloss over that, I think Ben is able to kind of just make you imagine it for yourself without getting into the nitty gritty. True, true. And uh, sometimes the best horror does that, mm-hmm. right? Where instead of showing you, it just having you interpret it, like it's it's there, it's implied. And yeah, it was gruesome. You were talking about Dr. Campbell. Mm-hmm. I think he's he's one of the ones who talks about like why the violence was so gruesome, right? Kind yeah. of and to make a, a purposeful statement. But I think yeah. that's why it's important not to talk about it too. Yeah. Or or display it as such. Yeah. And I know you, Vanessa, you had spoken about um to to us about uh how um you had spent some time in what is did you ever how did you feel about the border the divide or, you know, Paso, the Paso Juarez divide? Hmm. I mean, I was really young when it all started. Um, I remember I didn't necessarily grow up, but I kind of did in Juarez um, mm-hmm. in the sense that my family would go every weekend and we'd have like a big cookout. The whole family was there, all my cousins. And we would all just that was like our home base. Like we'd all connect and touch base there and then I guess around what like 2006 Mm -hmm. my family started to not go and it was interesting to see that like that home base changed from being the one that I had always known to being like an aunt's house here Mm. and my grandma doesn't even have the house in Juarez anymore so like Mm. that's interesting Mm. because sometimes I still go and I will pass by the house and it's like there's so many memories there that Mm -hmm. I barely remember and like I wish that I could go back and like actually like walk through the house again Mm -hmm. well speaking of which um that reminds me one of the stories is about the photograph and it's just you know um you know we'll dive into it in the next episode but you know it's just this um photograph that they're trying to find which bar it is that his parents went to. Mm. Um, mm. Um, can't remember off the top of my head right now, but, you know, he asked everyone, like he has his uncle, his aunt, uh, like, where are my parents here? You know, it's about the memory of a photograph. What does a photograph represent when, you know, you don't, you lost that connection, right? Because I think it seems the same thing happened to you. And, um, you you have that sense of nostalgia that I can identify in. and and uh, it, it is unfortunate, right, that a lot of us did have to kind of uh, close ourselves off because of the violence, if if we could, if we could, and yet um, 
you know, there is a loss regardless, right? Even if you didn't lose any loved ones, which of course is, is, is the, the best thing to, that this could happen. Um, there's uh, another kind of loss that I think uh, the book also, the collection also speaks to. Um, and I think um, the other little thing that I wanted to mention about why this is important is when I have my students read it, first, it's the first book they've read about the border. And second, it's the first book they've read with gay characters. And I think um, that says a lot about, you know, our high school curriculum. Mm -hmm. That says a lot about the canon, like I've been saying. And, uh, you know, the canon itself, of course, right? It's just mm -hmm. like we, we, we determine <clears throat> the canon, right? The canon isn't set in stone. Right. Um, so I think this is why, ultimately, why we decided on this book. Um, to all the listeners out there. Right on. But like we we're saying, you know, please give us your questions about it, your memories of what is, you know, that we can maybe relate to the book. So, if you have a chance, pick it up and read it. Join us while we're reading it. It's a very quick read, too. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for joining us in our discussion on Everything Begins and Ends at the Kentucky Club by Ben Sines. Don't forget to join us on our next episode as we continue this discussion. And if you haven't read it, we hope we inspire you to pick up a copy. Follow us on Instagram at literallyliterary.ep.